I'm always looking for new ways to help people connect to faith and to our tradition. And I came across an idea from a UCC pastor in Connecticut this week, Reverend Maxwell Grant. He was speaking a little bit about baptism. And he said, what if, what if instead of a little chaste sprinkling of water on the forehead or even a full immersion on the banks of a local river or something in between, what if the only way to join the church was by skydiving? <laughs> Think about it. Free fall, then you pull the ripcord and a gentle floating to the ground. What's not spiritual about that? <laughs> I mean, to paraphrase him, you know, what better way to remember that your life is not your own? What better way to physically embody that trust and faith is often, often a leap into the unknown? And what better way to exercise trust? But imagine... Imagine what it would be like to go through that experience and then show up at church and be greeted by a room full of people who had been through that too. Right? You're not so sure. <laughs> How many of you have actually been skydiving? You think everyone should try it? Yes. See, there you go. You know, a relationship with the divine, however you name that, is meant to make us feel more alive. Since the early church days, it's not been skydiving, but baptism that has been the ritual, the sacrament that welcomes you into the church, capital C. And baptism has been, for many, a life-changing, powerful remarkable experience. I've experienced that in my own life, and I've experiencing, experienced it administering the rite of baptism to people over the decades. However, baptism has also been a decidingly divisive aspect of the church. Over the centuries, it has become, for some, very legalistic and often rule-bound, there are horrible stories of priests and pastors refusing to baptize people or using it as a gate to keep people in or out. In fact, baptism has been at the center of ugly church splits, which is absolutely contrary to the spirit of baptism. One pastor told the story of a 95-year-old woman who shared with her after she had preached a sermon on the fact that it is God who does the baptizing at some level. This elderly woman told her that she had a sister who was born before who was very sick, so sick that that sister never left the house. She'd only lived for two months, and during that period, some time was baptized by her grandmother. When the child passed away, the family went to their Lutheran church where they were lifelong members, to have a service for their child. And that pastor refused to hold the service in the sanctuary because he didn't baptize the baby. So the service was held in the basement of the church. Now you might say, okay, that's a little extreme. But I can tell you the truth. I could spend the rest of my time up here telling you equally extreme stories about how our tradition, about how baptism and other rites of our church were to are meant to communicate the love of God have been used in harmful and hurtful ways to so many people. I want to talk about the spirit of baptism and its importance, whether you've been baptized or not, because it's hugely significant because not understanding the heart of baptism throws the entire Christian tradition into question. That's a strong statement, isn't it? Let me say it again then. <laughs> not understanding the spirit and heart of baptism throws the entire Christian tradition into question. Christianity writ large in our country has gone awry.
a little help here, a little help. <laughs> and I'm going to be very blunt. It's largely those white evangelical Christians who are driving much of our current policy. Now, I'm not talking about Republican or Democrat. I'm not making a distinction between left and right. I'm making a distinction with what is moral, and that is different. Take, for instance, immigration. We can disagree about immigration policies. Absolutely. There's not one Christian immigration policy. Please don't hear that. But the discourse around immigration is characterized by such a lack of dignity and respect. Now, granted, politics hardly ever brings out the best in any of us. Let's admit that. It does not raise us to our humanistic level of discourse. However, I am deeply disturbed by the so-called Christian underpinnings of our current rhetoric in this country, especially, but not limited to, immigration. It is bigoted and narrow-minded, mean and cruel. And when it is done in a Christian language, something has gone terribly wrong. Again, I am not talking about political sides of Republican and Democrat, left or right. Can you hear me on that? Yes. It is the moral and Christian language that gets wrapped up in this, that we who embrace, however we do that, the Christian tradition, must speak up and out against in a different voice. Because the cruelty and mean-spiritedness is antithetical to the heart of the Christian tradition. Okay, let me go back to baptism for a minute. The reading today about baptism from Mark's gospel is very sparse. It's rough. It's raw. It's in the desert. The mad prophet John the Baptist in his camel skin. People coming confessing their sins. Not a bad thing to do from time to time. Then Jesus gets baptized, and people spend their time talking about why would Jesus be baptized? Why did he need to repent? And often the message is truncated there. You know, what's really true is that I actually sent the wrong verses to Zoe to print in the bulletin. I meant to send chapter 1, 4 through 11, and I sent 4 through 9. So the most important piece was left out. But that's where my epiphany came. Because that's where a lot of Christians stop reading. The next part says, as you heard it from God, God's self through the microphone, and just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn open, and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice said, you are the beloved, in you I am well pleased. Because one morning long ago, Jesus walked into the river as a Galilean peasant and walked out of the water filled with light as the burning radiant Christ. Because he internalized. The heavens were torn open. I've always pictured this very gentle, almost whispered, you are the beloved. 
No, the heavens were torn open. It was a full-bodied experience, like a Victoria Falls experience. In Zimbabwe, when I was there, seeing Victoria Falls, every one of your senses is engaged. You can't believe that your eyes are seeing a mile-long waterfall. You can't hear anything because of the thunderous sound of the water falling over the cliffs. The water is splashing, the mist splashing your face. You can smell the plants around you and the smell of the water. And your heart is thumping with the breathtaking beauty and majesty of it all. It's a full-bodied experience. Just like the heavens being torn open and hearing that voice, you are my beloved, in you I delight. We focus on the baptism, but we miss the blessing. And they cannot be separating, separated. Without the blessing, it's truncated. Are you making the connections? When you only have the baptism part and not the blessing, you have original sin. That's what you have. You're, that's the theology of it. You're washed clean because somehow your starting place is that you are so fundamentally flawed that something has to be happening to make you right, whether it's a sacrificial son or whatever it is. Isn't that the theology? But with the blessing of a totally different starting place. You don't start with the original son. You don't start with being fundamentally flawed as a human being made in the image of God. You start with original blessing. You are my beloved. In you I delight. That's the starting point. Where do you want to start? You are my beloved. It is more than an affirmation. It's more than an affirmation. We are addicted to affirmations here in Silicon Valley in our social media area, aren't we? I admit it. I see how many people like a Facebook post I put up. And if they don't, I check back in five or six hours just to see. Maybe they didn't see it the first time. We're addicted to affirmations. How many followers do we have on Instagram and Twitter and Spotify or whatever? You probably can't even follow anyone on Spotify, but you know what I mean. We get trophies for participation. Right? We're addicted. We love affirmation. We're hooked on it as a culture. Just like we like selfies. In fact, I was in a hotel this week where there was an actual spot painted on the floor that said, best selfie taken right here. <laughs> but even with the flood of affirmation that some of us receive, what do we really believe at the deepest level about ourselves? Oh, yes, we are a high-functioning, type-A culture. But in this meritocracy, what do we really believe about ourselves? You are my beloved is way more than an affirmation. It is a deep acceptance, a deep starting place, the ground on which we walk and the ground of our being. In you, I delight. It is that core identity, that essential worth, that state of unwavering regard. Are you living in that state? When we baptize a baby here and at the end, take the child down the aisle, what I feel from you as a congregation is unwavering regard. You don't think, oh man, that kid's probably fundamentally flawed. <laughs> right? Then how do we get to where many of us are as adults? Continually continually questioning the base 
of our acceptance. The ground, the ground, you are my beloved. In you, I have unwavering regard. That's your starting place. And nothing can change that. I think that's why people love it and hopefully never tire of it when we say, whoever you are, wherever you are, you're welcome. It's our attempt at unwavering regard of acceptance. The poet Jan Richardson says, Beloved, keep saying it, and though it may sound strange at first, Watch how it becomes part of you, how it becomes you, as if you never could have known yourself anything else, as if you could ever have been other than this, beloved. As if you and I have that starting place in our life, it will radiate out from us and change everything around us. Because if we know that we have unwavering regard we might just love others as we love ourselves and take up the level of regard for others made in the image of God. Truly knowing this and living from this place in our lives might be just as thrilling as skydiving. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>